So I think we'll just start off like we did last time with um, brief introductions of ourselves, and then we can jump into our discussion. So I'll start since I'm already talking. Uh, my name is Lucy, and I'm a library tech at the Ann Arbor District Library. I work in youth services, so I do story times and youth programming, and then I also do a lot of adult programming, um, specifically around books and reading. So that's me. Um, I'm Jacob. I, I work in the um, outreach department, which just means we're trying to figure out ways in which we can reach out to the community um, through the library. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth. Um, I'm a librarian at the library. I select our adult fiction and book on CD collection, but I also work um, in the youth department um, doing a lot of youth programming and story times and um, activities for um, the schools and, and camps and all that kind of stuff. So I am also delighted to be joining in the discussion this evening. Um, my name is Lauren and I'm a desk clerk at the Ann Arbor District Library, which means that I interact with patrons on a daily basis in normal times. Hi everyone, I'm Fatima Hawk, and I am the president of the Rising Voices Board, um, as well as the facilitator for the Unerased Book Club book discussions. And my name is Sheila. Um, I am on the C4 set board for Rising Voices. Uh, so equal but opposite uh, board of Fatima, and I am the founder and co-facilitator of the book club. And um, thank you, Fatima and Sheila, for, for joining us and facilitating this discussion with us. We are very excited. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Passage West by Rishi Reddy. Uh, this was published in 2020. So um, I will let you, Fatima and Sheila, sort of take it away. <laughs> So I'm actually going to turn it over to Fatima because she most recently read this and is brimming with thoughts and questions. Um, like I've received so many texts from her over the last few weeks. <laughs> so I would love for Fatima to leave this book club. Yeah, this is um, this is perhaps my favorite book read for from this year, actually. Um, so very excited to discuss it. Um, I think as we always start, just keep wanting to hear people's initial impressions and thoughts about the book, um, and then we can jump into other questions. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I was really excited to read this because it was not an aspect of American history that I was familiar with, which I think may be true for others, I don't know. Um, but um, so I was just really interested in the premise of, um, you know, and, and just the, I was just excited to learn about that and kind of just get um, to really, I mean, I know this is a fictional title, but I really felt like I actually learned a lot of facts too, just from, from reading it. And, and so I, I was, um, I, I, that was kind of my initial impression was just excitement and then really feeling like I was learning a lot as I, as I was reading. Yeah. And just to set that context for listeners who may not have read the book, you know, this is about Punjabi immigrants in California during the 19, early 1900s. So 1910, 1920. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not a history that we often hear about. And to further contextualize for folks who may not know who Punjabis are, it's an ethnic group uh, whose ancestral land uh, encompasses what is now most of Pakistan and the across the border from Pakistan into India. Yeah, I would say like Elizabeth, I was also um, interested to read this because it wasn't a chapter of American history that I knew about. And I did learn so much from reading this book. And I also, um, I loved the book and I loved the way that it was, it was like really a character driven book, but it was also so well researched. So you were just getting this history, but you, I also became really connected with the characters in it. So um, 
I, before we started, I was talking with Fatima, like it's, it's a long book, but it didn't feel long to me because I was so immersed in it. So um, I'm glad that it was a book that was picked because I'm not sure it would have come. I would have picked it up. I, I, I wasn't aware of it. So I was happy to learn. Yeah. I, I want to just piggyback on what Lucy just said um, and say that I, um, I thought that the characters in this book were amazing. I didn't really know too much about this book before um, it was offered up as a potential read to us. And, um, you know, I looked at the back cover, I read the blurb, someone mentioned uh, Steinbeckian in the sprawling like narrative. And I was like, I like that. I, I you know, I love East of Eden. I would give this a shot. And I was a little bit daunted at the beginning of this book because the cast of characters begins front and center. And I thought, oh, okay, all right. I got to really turn on my brain for this because there's a lot of names here. And I just took the plunge though, after about 30 pages of kind of feeling like, all right, I got to settle down into this. Um, I had the same experience as Lucy. It, it was impossible to stop reading. It was a really amazing, epic um, book that it, again, like as other people have mentioned, it's just, it's, it reverberates with me because this is American history. This is, this is, re this is real stuff. Although this is a historical fiction, um, it, it was just amazing. I, I thought that so well written, loved it. Um, I was particularly excited to check out this book because, um, my family on both sides come are, are farmers. Um, and a, a lot of the books that my family kind of passes around to each other are these giant farm family epics, you know? Um, so I was really eager to pick this up to read a big farm family epic that's not so white centric, that isn't white centric rather. So, um, that's something that draw me that drew me into the book at, at first and really what made it so readable as well. Of course, the characters, but I was like, there was that connection there. So that was exciting. Uh, Jacob, I totally hear you on that. So I'm from Missouri, very agricultural. Um, definitely like think about the ways that agriculture culture and like the stories around agriculture omit so many other experiences. Um, and my husband's Punjabi. And so when I saw this book, I immediately like was really excited, um, was excited to share it with him, um, especially because like in his family, they have agricultural scientists and like water engineers. And so like culture has manifested in different ways and it's, it's still very much part of their culture. Um, and I actually want to pull back a little bit. Um, so I, I picked this, I picked up this book because in 2013, I was living in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I happened to be at the American embassy for some meeting and was waiting in, and they have a, a nice little library and I picked up a book and I can't remember the name of the book, but it was like middle school, junior high level reading. And in that book, they talked about Mexican Punjabi communities and weddings. And I, my mind was blown. Like here I am at 22, just now for the first time learning that Punjabis have been in the US for a lot longer than what like this general narrative gives us. And so when I saw this book come out, I, I knew I had to like get more like meteor story, even though it was fictionalized to feel like a sense of place and like in the U S. Yeah. I also just, um, loved the book for how expansive it was. And I think one of the first things I sent to Sheila was like, this is like Steinbeck. And so I hear you, Lauren, about that, just feeling the the descriptions and the way that you get a sense of the place itself and the land um, that I thought that was super powerful for a book that is centered around cultivating land and living off of that. Um, so very much, very much appreciated it. And it's also new to me American history right like I'm I was aware of like Japanese American farmers in California but I wasn't and aware of Sikh and Punjabi farmers and so that was again just like mind blown um and um and I again I'm also I'm Bangladeshi and I'm aware of Bengali history and how um 
um, a lot of the uh, routes uh, via boats and things like that, like coolies working came into New York and um, intermarried with the black and uh, um, Puerto Rican folks um, in alongside the Eastern coast. But I, again, I wasn't aware of the Mexican and Punjabi and Sikh connections. And so that was really cool to find out. Um, so I guess that could, um, that could lead us into this next question of like, um, how does starting the book with family schisms set up the rest of the story? Well, one thought I had about that is that um, I think what it helps or what it helps set up for me is that I, I think what this book does a great job with is showing that like the immigrant experience for a lot of, for these people is unique to each person. Each person approaches it differently and, and their relationship with the U S differently. Um, but there's also this, um, shared experience that they're going through just because of the way that immigrants are looked at, um, by non-immigrants in this, or, you know, everyone's an immigrant, but by white people in this country. Um, and so I think that, uh, I think that having those schisms in the beginning sort of is a, is a good indicator of the fact that like not everybody is going to follow the same path and not everybody in these families is going to be seeing eye to eye along the way. Um, I think to, this is, I guess it's a slightly a different, uh, I, 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 it's not, not necessarily piggybacking off that, but I found it really interesting. Um, like, I don't want to call it a sense of dread, but kind of like the foreshadowing in the early, in the first like hundred pages or so, like you kind of get the, you get the sense that like, you know, things are not like this book, you like, as I was reading the book, I was like, okay, things are not going to go perfectly because there's still, you know, 400 more pages. So we just know that this is like, not going to go, you know, that there's going to be a lot that happens. Um, and I really, I was like, found myself, you know, as they're setting up the cotton and the farm and everything, you know, wondering really like what, what was going to happen. And I found that like making me eager to continue reading. No, that's not really like a family schism thing, but it was just kind of good, just foreshadowing for me to just uh, be like, okay, like what, you know, what's, what's going to happen with this? Um, so I, I really appreciated that kind of setup in the, in the first quarter or so of the book. Yeah. And I would be lying if, if, if I didn't say in, in those first 30 pages, the author says, you know, Karak's going to San Quentin. And I was like, man, don't tell me that right now. And I was kind of like, well, that's, you know, I had falsely assumed that that was kind of the mystery to be solved in the book. But what I came to find out is I think it's, it's it, what it is, it's a book about relationships. It's a book about history as well. But the mystery that I was kind of unfurling throughout the book was how Ram and Karak um, come to be where they end up, if that makes any sense. Right, because that's how the book opens, right? Jacob is like, they're, they're basically like, they say like the only two left kind of, and they've had this complicated relationship. You get the impression, which then you later learn about, but it's just really interesting. It's like, whoa, how did this, you know, how did this, how did they end up in this like very opening, you know, and then you go back in time and, and learn about it. But yeah, that was super interesting to me as well. Yeah. And I think they are putting there, she is putting these little pieces in there. Like I went back and I reread the beginning when I finished it. Cause I was like, wait, what did I not pay attention to? And it's like, it's Ram's son, David, you know, um, pick or he's picking him up at the hospital. And, and then you hear a little bit later about Ram's wife, um, Padma, who's not in the U S with him. And like, if, so if you, if I had really stopped then and thought I would have thought like well wait a minute who's the child that he has you know so she's putting these things in there but I think you can choose to I mean I guess you if you don't know the 
the rest of the story, you might not notice those little pieces of information. I just think that's a really great way to bookend your story with like the, these two things that are the same, the end and the beginning, but you don't know when you're starting it. So I really loved that about it. Um, I really, I think, I mean, yes, I wrote the question, but that's because I also did not know how to like grapple with the, the, the vastness of family. And like you start off the book with conflict and not if it's longstanding conflict and the middle really shows how many um, immigrants, especially before and migrants before telecoms was a thing before you could call FaceTime, like email your family like how vitally important it was to have some sort of relation nearby, whether it's a distant cousin or somebody who's from the same region, but not actually related to you. And what that means for keeping yourself feeling whole and not adrift at sea and making choices that didn't feel familiar to you. Um, like you're right, Lucy, like at the end with the, the mirror image of the beginning, you have the two sides of the same situation and like literally two sides because they're across the world from each other. Um, just really underscoring the ramifications of distance and not having a community to tie you down into your values and roots. I, um, I constantly came back to this question of like, how is she defining family here? Uh, because uh, it took so many iterations, right? There is uh, Ram's family back home that he's supporting, but then there's like the micro family of with his wife, right? And mother. And, and there's also the families that he makes while he's in America, right? And there's uh, when he finally kind of decides that this community of people are going to be my family. Um, at some point, I was also wondering, like, is Karak part of his family, right? And where does that, because there is a lot of, a lot in that relationship that it was even queer coded in my eyes, where the, I I honestly wasn't sure if like, what, is this going to turn into a love story, right? I, I Jacob has lots to say, so I'm going to pause here and have. I, I don't have much to say. It's just like emphatic, like, yes. <laughs> right. But also. Uh, with the relationship between Harry and yeah. Amanji. Yes. I was like, when they go to war, there's, I can talk about it. I, I need to, because uh, <laughs> I could talk about it at length. So I'm just, I, I'm just emphatically screaming. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I was reading that too. And I was thinking again, just like the families you get to have versus the families you don't get to have um, and the families you build because you are in very specific circumstances that are limiting in its own way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kept thinking about that and coming back to it because it's a huge part of the immigrant experience is, is this notion of family and who counts as family. I think too, it's just kind of, um, you know, just, well, Sheila had mentioned that it's before, like, you know, telephone, computer, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, like, Ram didn't even realize that, like, he had had a child, you know, like, and that is such a completely, like, mind boggling concept for most of us now, because, you know, even if you do have family in another country or on a different continent, like, there's so many ways to be in touch. Um, but, you know, that was like, and he, like, he found out months later, it wasn't like, you know, and, and it was, that was just a really fascinating little, like, just like thing that happened early on that really like gave me pause. It was like, wow. And I, and like, I think he was sad that he couldn't meet his child, but it also wasn't that crazy of a concept because that's what immigrants at the time, like that happened to a lot of people, you know, like they left family behind and, and then they didn't get to talk to them very, you know, I mean, there was just letters and that was just really a, like a thing that stood out to me early on too. I really loved the character of Javon Singh and um, just loved how, speaking of family, like he was, you know, sort of this anchor person. Um, I mean, um, everyone or Ram and Karak refer to him as Baiji. I'm mispronouncing that. Um, which I looked up and it's uh, <laughs> the term means like 
older like brother in a in like a um as a sign of respect and although they're not related by blood to javon javon is this like incredibly stable like presence in their lives as they try to figure out what they're doing and how to farm what to, who to talk to uh, how to make something right how to smooth something over and it just um it got me thinking about this notion of okay like he really is kind of looking out for them as a big brother would as an older kindly brother would and um helps them in moments um you know of just uh, you know urgency and then I don't know I, I don't want to give anything away but like I loved at the end to see how kind of things changed in that relationship um and um I thought that was just incredibly powerful. It got me thinking just about how roles in families change, you know, like you, 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 you put on a new role um, as someone else enters your family. And that just felt incredibly accessible and, and just right. Very human. Yeah. I actually wanted to make a comment to Elizabeth's point about like the telecoms part and just in my lifetime, I have very vivid memories of my dad using a calling card to call his family in India. And now like my mom's father, who's been in this country since the sixties, will like four way WhatsApp video call with my brother and his family in India. Um, and like my dad talks to his family all the time. Like my in-laws are in Dubai and we constantly, like they call every day. So it's just such a drastic shift even in 30 years that like it's it's still like, kind of hard for me to like keep up emotionally with, like the expectation of how frequently we talk when we, I wasn't raised talking as frequently with my family abroad um and like I can only imagine like what it would feel like for Ram to like go from not even knowing he had a son to now like being in this 1970s 1980s towards the end of the book and like imagining like the amount of contact or information he could have had access to. Yeah, I absolutely echo those things because um, when I, I'm also an immigrant, right? I moved when I was a child and I remember back then um, my family, uh, my maternal family lived in the village. And so there was no phone lines to be accessed, right? So you had to go to a um, travel agency that had a phone and you had to go during hours that made sense for them, but also made sense for us. The calls were pretty much like non-existence and letters did take weeks. And this is in the late nineties, early two thousands where letters could still take several weeks to get to you. Um, so to go from that to now, like my aunt calling me up at you know, all hours for her or me on WhatsApp and video chatting me. I mean, it's just, it's wild. It's absolutely mind boggling. Yeah. Um, I actually came across, so Jenny Bott, who is the curator of the Daisy Books podcast and is the author of a set of short stories. I'm actually going to look up the name of it because it's, uh, it's called Each of Us and it's really good. Highly recommend that set of short stories as well. But she posed this question on Twitter that, um, really had me thinking and it was what is your favorite piece of uh historical fiction like in the south asian context and people kept giving her suggestions but she was like no that's a period piece not historical fiction and i'm curious like with that like prompt like what are your guys's ideas like in how this book fits into that and we can talk about what those definitions mean but i would just gonna leave it at that What, what I think good historical fiction does is it is as much about history as it is about today. And um, I think that's something that separates it from a period piece. So as I'm reading certain things about how people in the community react to um, people of color in their community, I, I, I thought this is powerful historical fiction because it's, it's teaching me about the past, but it's also um, telling me to look in the now. Um, and that there might not have been too much growth in between then and now. Yeah, I also think something that um, I totally agree with with what you just said, Jacob. And I think that that's um, this book did 
does have you thinking, or it would be difficult not to be thinking about current circumstances while you're reading a book like this. Um, something I think that the author does to, in my mind, to, to make this into historical fiction is she's putting um, a real timeline in there. Like you could go back and you could look at the history of that area in the Imperial Valley in those years, and you would see it reflected in what she's writing. And then she even goes far enough to pull in like an actual person in the character of um, Thind, and he was in a, and he was part of a landmark case in deciding, you know, who gets to be white in this country. And so I think um, to put those actual pieces in, you you would have to know that you're do. I would think you would want to know that you were doing it in the most accurate way that you could. So I think that for, for me, that would make something historical fiction um, because it's reflecting an actual history and it's required to be um, correct. I think, you know, like really, I mean, historical fiction takes a lot of research you know, it takes, it's, it's almost, it's almost like writing nonfiction in some ways, except with this added, you know, creative element, not that nonfiction can't be creative, but I mean, I've, um, I've always thought that good historical fiction, you know, typically if you sometimes in the acknowledgements, you know, there'll be, they'll be, they'll cite things or they'll say like, thanks, you know, I read all these books. If you want to learn more about this, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I've always found that really interesting. And I think, um, I think the author for Passage West certainly, um, you know, did a great deal of research and and put in those, like you were saying, Lucy, you know, element, you know, real elements that um, she wanted to portray accurately. Um, so, and not that a not that a period piece wouldn't take some research, but I think you know, there's just not as much true history in, in those often. Yeah, I think I really liked how Miss Reddy in this book set like helped us as the readers know that this was rounded in a lot of exhaustive research i mean and she sets it up right there at the beginning with this cartoon that's actually printed in the a san francisco newspaper in 1910 uh and it, the title is a new problem for uncle sam right and there's that stare there's, there's that caricature of uncle sam and he's holding up this puny looking human and he's calling over at a British, uh, you know, whatever the British version of Uncle Sam is. And he said, you know, we want, we don't want this person. We want this person like gone, you know, and it's a, it's a Hindu and you see the little label and you see all the, the, the description, incompetence, indolence. And I mean, it, it, you, you encounter a lot of racism in this book. Um, and uh, you see as a reader that, the racism, uh, like Jacob said, I mean, it, it, you can't help but think about how it exists to this day and it, its legacy is really, really deep. Um, and, uh, but you see that it was there. It's real. It's in, it's, it's, it's inarguable fact. And it was printed in the newspapers and we've got those records and Ms. Reddy inserts them in ways, I think in, in really critical moments of the narrative. Um, which I appreciated. I actually, um, I think that one of the things that she does really well is kind of show personal experiences of racism. But at the same time, what I love about the book is that it shows the role of the law in creating systems of oppression, right? So we, and we get to see this like before and after, right? Before the thin case was, uh, you know, like, like, uh, decided, uh, we got to see who counted as white and some of the labels associated with it. We got to, before um, laws about ownership, land ownership came about, we got to see who got to own it and who got their lands taken away, right? So their Japanese and American neighbors, you know, as well as like who could purchase land, um, naturalized citizenship versus, you know, like having been born, um, all those things as well as um, like Harry's, you know, going off to war, right? And and, um, and uh, 
Amarjeet as well, to be able to gain citizenship in that way and have that citizenship be upheld. Um, I just thought that the way that she showed how their, their entire systems of like racism was systemic. And I really appreciated that because I don't think we get very much opportunities to see that in such a way in books or in other portrayals. And I think she did a really fabulous job with that. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, I was, I was oh, Lauren, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I, well, I have that, what you just said, um, Fatima was really like spoke to me. It just really, it brought me to the character of Clive and I'm thinking of Clive and uh, um, he's a white man who, you know, uh, is, is friendly, um, you know, with uh, uh, Karak and Javan um, and Ram and, um, and yet there's this like moment when because of the, I guess, machinations of the law and uh, through own, uh, I guess, like just rejiggering of the laws, um, he is now in a position where he shows his, his real thoughts and feelings uh, about, um, uh, you know, that community. And it's, I just found that to be, um, wow, I've never seen that happen in a book before. It really blew me away to see how, um, you know, the story shows how that subtle like shift or actually the dramatic shift creates this, the conditions in which like the tables totally turn. And I've got to admit that, I mean, when I was reading this and I mean, you encounter this throughout the, the, the story, right. Of like this concept of a race, right. And what, who belongs, who doesn't belong, who gets to decide that. It's mostly just they decide it, right? Like, um, and, and, and yet the characters are coming to grappling with, it goes back to that question of family, right? Like who's gonna be in my family? Who, who, get, who could I possibly conceive of being in my family in this unknown foreign place? Um, and I really felt for the characters. It just, it, it, I felt bewildered as a reader. Um, and, and maybe that's also because of who I am and I haven't had to think about that very often, right? Um, and, but it was, it was just kind of mind-bendingly like, difficult <laughs> to, to keep track. Whoa, like things change so quickly on a dime. And then as a result, I mean, everything, the, right? Unthinkable things happen, right? Incredible things possibly could happen perhaps, but just, it, it just got me thinking about it how incredibly uh, <laughs> um, uh, fragile, right? Our conceptions of self are. Yeah, I mean, to that point, um, something I actually found a little bit lacking in the, in the book is um, because it's only one book, a lot of things are abbreviated. And so I think about the power of um, trilogies or like extended series. So I loved the Ibis trilogy by Mitha Ghosh because he's able to explore really in depth like the impact of the opium wars, but from a different lens. It's another historical, well, I don't know if it's a period piece or historical fiction. I read it a long time ago, but um, I really wish that Reddy was able to parse this out and give a little bit more breathing room to each of these points um, because the it's, she only spends about like 10 pages on, on Bhagat Singh Din who is a, like, is a very important figure, not just in like South Asian immigration history, but in like case law, because after the Tin verdict, like all Indian Indians in America who had citizenship lost their citizenship for 20 years. It was, everybody's was rescinded. And so this idea of like, um, like this fragility, the fragility of being here or like the, it, our existence is so conditional on the temperament of whoever is in power. It's much longer than just like the last 10 years or 12 years. It's uh, a it's hundred years ago, but then pulling all the way back to Fatima's point um, at the very beginning of this conversation about understanding Bengali history in the US, there's a huge difference between the way that North Indians reacted to being discriminated against and the way that Bengalis reacted to being discriminated against. North Indians, who came here and who were Hindu really played into their own caste privilege from being like Brahmins or taught like high caste in India and tried to like align themselves with the equivalent of high caste here, which is whiteness. 
but Bengali Muslims who are outside of the Hindu caste system or like the primary, primary social caste system in India didn't do that. Like that wasn't even part of their survival tactic. It was marrying into communities that welcomed them. And that's, uh, and while like in this, in this book, and there are obviously instances of Punjabi Mexican intermarrying, the fact that like somebody went to the Supreme Court to gain citizenship and using whiteness as the, the rationale for it is something I wish was explored a little bit more. Um, and obviously like page restrictions, I get it, but um, for non-South Asian readers, it's a huge omission that continues to perpetrate this idea that like caste doesn't inform our existence here too. Yeah, I was thinking about that with the um, thinned case because I had recently listened to a podcast where they were talking about that and they do, they talked about how he used specifically caste in that case. Like he said, not only am I white because I am Caucasian, but I'm also of a high class. So I have experience with power and I have experience with oppression. Like I have the ability to oppress other people. So doesn't that make me white and American, which is so interesting to me. Um, yeah. And I, and, and I asked, there's also pieces in this book where you see, you know, like Ram struggles to find um, like he has moments where he says things about Japanese people or Chinese people. He doesn't really even want to shake the neighbor's hand at one point. And so you just, see that there's so many levels and layers. And um, when there's this huge system of racism being put upon you, it's like these survival mechanisms almost, like how am I going to get to the top of the pile? And when we talk about these systems, it reminds me of a, of a feeling that I had throughout reading this book as well, which I, I came to a point where I was tired of hearing it from Rom's perspective. I was tired hearing it from Karak's perspective. I wanted to hear it from the perspective of the women in the book. I, um, I desperately wanted to know what Kishin thought. I desperately wanted to know um, more about Padma's life in India. And at the end, the epilogue, my reaction to it was, I, I was surprised to find out that I was angry. It was like, how dare you tack this on? And that's, it's these little three and a half pages. I was like, no, 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 no. I need the whole but then I think Padma lived in kind of the um, margins of, of everyone's lives. So that anger I felt is probably, I can imagine as anger that she felt as well, that really it, it's a three page summary tacked on at the end. That was a, a really frustrating thing, but it, it also made it really exciting. Um, so yeah, I would love to know more about, um, I wanna see things from Adela's perspective, Rose's perspective, Leela's perspective, yeah. Yeah. Damn. I mean, I didn't really think about that, Jacob. Like uh, I had that feeling at the end of reading it and kind of just going like, hmm. Yeah. But I didn't make that really deep visceral connection that you made of like, no, this isn't all right. This isn't all right. That this is the way it's portrayed. This is not okay. And that perhaps the author intended you to feel something along the lines of what you have felt. felt. So that's really good that you bring that up. That's interesting to me. I mean, I felt like, um, I really wanted to get into Kishin's head too. Uh, I thought, wow, she's, you know, she's been holding it down here on the farm forever, like making zillions of rotis. Like, I want to know like what actually she is like thinking about all this. And there comes a moment, you know, when Rob's really low and she's like, I really think you should go. Or she makes it, she makes Javon, her husband say something. It's clear to Rom, like, oh, she's the one who cares about me and is making making this move on my behalf. That's, but, but yeah. And obviously there are like some powerful other female figures in here. Um, but yeah, I found myself wanting more uh, 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 because yeah, I had that feeling of like, I don't want to hear that like again and again, that like Ram's having this existential crisis about whether or not he can like actually like date a Mexican like it, it was just really <laughs> frustrating um, as a reader. And I, I wonder if maybe the author intended for us to feel a bit of that. Well, kind of to that point, when, because the, the women characters 
live on the margins, does writing about them more extensively turn into a period piece as opposed to historical fiction? It's like their stories aren't written down. You can't go back in time and find them. That's an interesting question. I listened to, um, the, in an email that you sent, you had linked a podcast that was an interview with the author. And she talked about how she had a whole story for Keyshawn and she she cut it because she had, I mean, she had a lot of stuff. Um, so it's an interesting choice. Like why did that come out? And maybe like what you're saying, Sheila, it didn't fit into the accuracy and maybe it was more imagined um, because there was nothing with a specific timeline or specific dates in our history that she could tie it to. But I was just interested to hear that, that we, we, we could have heard more and maybe we, will uh, i mean in a different iteration maybe she'll turn it into a different book or a story or something but um it is interesting that it, that so much of this book takes place from the male perspective for me i as i was reading it i felt very much pulled toward the present and my own history as well as that um the past yeah. especially because um i grew up in detroit and i grew up in detroit at a time when a lot of the bangladeshi immigrants in detroit were men who hadn't yet reunited with their families um, um in america so in the they started really um, on mass migrating to Detroit area um, during the 90s. And it wasn't until the early 2000s when a lot of people were able to bring their families to America as well and reunite with them. So I grew up in a household very similar to, to what was in the book, which is like mostly men and, you know, and some children and one or two female figures around me. Um, and, uh, and so I, as I was thinking about this, I was like, oh, I think I can imagine the lives that these women must have lived. And also, um, especially Padma back in, um, back in India and what her life must have been uh, like. And, and I read so much like subtext in her letters to her husband, even when it was like very politely worded or even seemingly sweet, but you can tell that she was so frustrated and so fed up and wanting to know when are you returning? And, uh, you know, it's so great that you're doing all these things for your family, but your like extended family, but what about us? Like, do you even think of, and I, I just felt the, maybe the anger, the resentment or the hopelessness or the anxiety around it because she has so much of that. So even though for me, even though there is not an explicit mention of all these women who are on the periphery, I thought that there was a lot that just still came through um, from their stories. I'm curious if you all have read other fictional accounts of Angel Island. Because this was my first, uh, it's not my first, because like um, there have been a few other Asian American books we've read that have Angel Island as a point of reference, but this is, I think, my first memorable like piece of literature with a strong scene at Angel Island. Yeah, I had never encountered that before either. Um, and um, as someone who's lived in San Francisco for a while and gazed upon that island, it really kind of transformed my memories thinking about this is sort of this just like holding cell for people, sort of place where you get punted back um, if you don't do or say the right things. Yeah, I think it's so often referred to as like the Ellis Island of the West Coast, but it's just, not you know it's, it's it's the opposite it's not about letting people in it's a gate to like you know keep them out and I thought that that scene in this book I have not encountered something like that in in fiction and I thought it was heartbreaking and 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 also there's an example where she's kind of like using a female character to let you know what the like the literacy laws or you know she's got to be able to read this many words um to come into this country and, and 
it also brings to mind, like for me, current day times where I think in this country, we ask immigrants to do better or no more than people who already live here. Like there were probably a lot of people in the country at the time who couldn't read at all, but we're going to require that of each person who comes in. And that, that scene really struck me. Um, and it was just so sad to me that she was turned away. And then, and I think Padma's story in general was really sad. I mean, she just was left with not much hope and not much, not much. So it was, it was, um, it was sad, but that scene, especially I thought was very heartbreaking. And made all the more heartbreaking when you consider the geography and you might consider the fact that, you know, her husband is on the shore and he kind of can make her out, like uh, you can see her and the baby on the ship. And I mean, it's, it's like really intimate, right? It's, and, and talk about like telecom and stuff and like, you know, like how that, that was the closest they got and they were so damn close. And then it's just like wrenched from you. And then you get her letter who she mentioned where she mentions that, oh yeah, like on the boat back, you know, someone um, decided to jump overboard on the second day. And I had to like reread that and go, oh yeah, that's suicide. You know, that's, that's death. Um, and that she was considering that herself. And yeah, that was very, um, tough. Uh, that was a very tough, um, story. Uh, to your point, Lucy, about the story of Angel Island, just proving that immigration wasn't open to everybody. I, it just continuously reminds me that there is a specific notion of what America is and looks like. And immigration law has always been about maintaining that. Um, so during Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I did my own reading and like did a presentation for work on what actually makes up Asian America and looking at the list of immigration laws that explicitly target Asian migrants um, is the case law for immigration law now. And that's what binds us all together is basically when were we let in to do work? When were we barred from doing, from being let in? When were we stripped of access to citizenship? And at what point did the U.S. try to invade those countries? And like, that's kind of all what binds us all together. And um, like books like Passage West are so deeply important to humanizing the impact of those laws because we think about the ways that post-65 immigration has looked. We know the stories because those people are part of our families, but we don't have the stories from before. We don't have a way of like understanding how the macro politics impacts the micro day-to-day. -day. Like um, Lauren, I think you were saying the, the whiplash of like day-to-day -day what could happen is like something like so many families with immigrants face day-to-day -day. and it's not new and it's still like deeply painful. <laughs> And we just don't get to have those stories. So that's like my big feeling about Passage West and why it's so important in the canon. And I also like to tack on to that, th this idea of how it wasn't, it wasn't just like who, um, not being able to reunite with your family, but also just how much you couldn't, go back if you wanted to because the chances of like being taken into war for the british for example right and have being um being called in that way so it's not like you would get to regain your life if you were to go back and what would you be going back to so i i kept thinking about how how there were really no good options for these characters so even if they were homesick they couldn't do anything um and either way, their life was not their own. And even how they ended up in America was kind of like through this routed system of like, I was serving for the British and I came in and, um, and I landed here. And this is like part of my freedom, even though I'm still a British subject. Yeah. 
Yeah, was it Ram, the character Ram, who was wondering, or he, he had, he, there's a moment when one of the main characters is considering how life was back in India and how, wait, like, I think the British did this and allowed us to do this. So aren't they good? And someone has to check him and go like, no, they wanted to do this so that they could exploit you. Like, that's what was going on. And he goes, and there's like a moment where he goes, oh, like, I, that was eye-opening to me as a reader to realize that like there is a certain level of like this isn't this isn't explicitly <laughs> made like written up like this is what we're doing here it's like there's a certain um you know amount that the, the powers that be like the british in this case are just gonna do what they're gonna do and they're gonna see what they can get away with and they're gonna push you in certain areas and they're gonna welcome you know a certain mindset a mentality and they're going to try to cultivate that kind of mentality among their subjects or the subjugated and um that that was just a powerful moment in the story to me i think she also did a really great job of kind of portraying the different ways in which people try to fit into america and and gain acceptance in america so whether it's like if i serve in this war then i will be considered an american hero and we really got to see that happen where even someone who did like harry gave his life to being a hero but then his family got nothing in the end, right? Lost everything. Um, or even just like the way that Amarjeet was um, like left out by all the military folks, right? From gatherings and from, um, from participating fully and how that is what radicalized him as opposed to any of the other experiences that had led into it. This like constant rejection because even though you've served in the same military, like war served in the same military, fought the same war, fought for democracy and all that, and still end up being an outsider. Um, yeah. That I I have to I just have to say that like Amarjeet was an amazing character to me, and like I was rooting for that guy. Like you know, <laughs> like I was rooting for him when. Oh, you know, some of his elders were like recognizing, like, you're a young man, you know, like you, you just, you got to get off the farm. I get it. You know, like, he's like, yep, yep. That's what I'm doing. You know, yeah. bye. Um, and, 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 and just, but him, like, first of all, like that was a cliffhanger. I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't sure if he was going to return from war and he does. And that all happens like this, this rejection happens at the moment when he realizes like, I've done the thing, right? Like I'm an American, I have proven myself and, and my, and my comrade has proven himself and um, it's never enough. Yeah. It's like never enough. And he gets that, like he, he gets it. You know, he goes to the diner or wherever after the, he gets kicked out of the fancy ballroom and, and he waits and then he realizes nobody's showing up none of these white boys are showing up for me. So, and that, and then he, and then like, thank goodness. Like this was like somebody like, you know, the transformation happens and he, and he finds his way um, and he's there for his family. Um, and I was just like, I don't know. There's all these strands, all these crazy <laughs> stories, all these great stories, all these great characters. And Amarji was just, his, his story really spoke to me. Yeah, I, I do feel like um, there you could we could go on forever with this because there are so many different stories and like you know I have like these pages of notes and I'm like, but we didn't talk about you know it's because there's history and it's important history and then there's the characters. And like you're saying, Lauren, you're just, you're rooting for them. Um, and so um, there's just so much, much here. I think it was a great um, book to discuss. I'm so glad to be part of a discussion, but I wonder if this is a good um, time to sort of finish our discussion. We've been at it for an hour. So um, is there any, like, if, unless anyone else has something that's just screaming to come out of them. Not about the book, but about the book club. 
Um, the book club is open to all readers. You don't have to be Asian American to read the books. Um, all we do, all we uh, expect is that you come in with an open mind, open heart, and ready to discuss what the book is about. Um, next week's, their next month's book is Future Face by Alex Wagner. It's a memoir slash nonfiction um, exploration of what DNA testing and family history means. Um, Alex Wagner is known for her Showtime show, uh, Cir The Circus, which is all about politics. She's a, a news reporter, a po political reporter. So um, very, very interesting person, very interesting story. And um, if you are interested in learning more about the books we will be reading, please check out unerasedbookclub.com. And I'm so grateful that the Ann Arbor District Library continues to want to have us to talk about these books. It means a lot to me, and I hope it means a lot to, I'm sure it means a lot to Fatima that uh, this community cares about the types of books that aren't normally on the front page. And I'd also like to add that we're actually going to be doing an Instagram live with the author Rishi Reddy um, in July. Uh, <laughs> I know it's so exciting. Um, so it will be on uh, July 2nd at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, I hope that you can um, come join us in the conversation. There will be an opportunity for the audience to ask her questions directly. And uh, you can just find us at our Instagram handle at unerased uh, book club. Yeah. And we can link that in our, our node for this event so that if people Thank you. want to be able to participate in that, they have an opportunity to do so. so. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Fatima and Sheila for uh, leading us in this discussion and Jacob and Lauren and Elizabeth for joining in. Um, I was really so glad to be able to discuss this book. So thank you. Thank you so much. Same.